I have gathered us here today because one person has asked for an in-depth review of how I do my artist alley table. So without further ado, let's get started. Welcome to my living room. So since most artist alleys provide a six foot table, I'm gonna be working with a six foot table myself here in this little setup. So let's get the table. Let's get these out of the way. Excuse me, Omar. Omar can be there. Okay, so I always build my table from the like outside in. And so the base of it all is the table and the tablecloth. So this is the tablecloth that I have. I've had this for years and it's just something I got on Amazon. It's not custom at all, but it's this like plasticky kind of picnic material, which I really, really like because in the event of spills or something, it's easy to just like wipe off. And I always have an iced coffee in the morning. So, you know, like when the coffee kind of sweats and then it like dribbles down, it makes it easy to just wipe off, so. First thing first, get your tablecloth. And most tablecloths are not floor length. This is even on both sides right now. But what I end up doing is just pulling this forward. So the edge of the front is all the way to the floor. And it helps if it's even all the way across. I'm just gonna borrow this guy so the tablecloth stays put. I've like, barely exerted myself and I'm already starting to get warm. It's time for the hair to go up. Do I look cute? I don't know. And then for branding purposes, I have a table runner and I just got this made on Vistaprint. And it is a really long table runner. And it's actually kind of annoying because I have all this like extra fabric. It would go across the whole length of both sides of the table. And I don't really like that. I like the vendor side to be open so I have easy access to grab shit when I need it. But because it's so long, I actually opted to roll it up like this. Honestly, I could just cut it, but I'm scared of commitment like that. So I just rolled it up and binder clipped it. So it's constantly always like this, just so it's the length that I want. And it's easy to just put on top. Nope. Plant. I like it in the center. And having a banner like this is just so nice because it just makes your branding so obvious. And obviously you want your artist alias or studio name on here, just so people can easily find you. And if you have a strong branding code, kind of like brand colors or something, definitely try to stick with it and portray it on your table. Like you want people to be attracted to your table. Yeah. Easy peasy. The base is done. Okay, so this is a question that I get asked a ton. Is how do you make your floating display? And I actually have a very specific kit that I use. It's a photography rig that usually you can like clamp to the table and then hook up your like cameras to for overhead shots or like panning shots or like desktop shots or whatever. Um, but this is what it looks like. So. Come, 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 come here. Okay, so the base looks like this. It has a clamp and a little screw handle thing right here. So it's a C clamp essentially with a built in metal pole. And basically, you just take this and you screw it like this. And this little platform will come down so you can open it. To the thickness of the table and then once it's secured you put it on to the ledge of the table and then you retighten it until it's stable like that and then after you do that the kit comes with a ton of these poles and i really like this because they come in separate pieces and they're essentially these hollow little poles like this they're lightweight and i think these are about 15 inches in length each. So the thing that does suck about these is that they are a set length. So if you're trying to get specifically into, let's say 
six feet above the ground or five feet above the ground or six feet or eight feet above the table height. You usually won't be able to get exact because these are set, right? So this pole is 15, this pole is 15. If you do the math, it doesn't quite come out to an even height usually. So either you have to risk overshooting or you have to risk just being under. But what's nice is that there is a screw here and then the opening right here. I forgot what are these called? These like rivets or what's this called? I don't know. You just put these in, screw it in like this. This kit also has these little holes for tiny screws for extra security, but because we're not hanging like cameras off of this, like thousands of dollars worth of cameras, I just took out all the little screws so you can, I'm not bothered by like doing an extra little step or losing those pieces. That's actually what happened. I just actually lost all the pieces because they just fall out. But once you screw it in, it's like very secure and these are super sturdy. Like look how thick this is. Something that I don't like about some of the telescoping ones is that they are so flimsy that once you put some weight on them with your posters or you hang them, it starts bowing. And I don't like the look of that. This is so hefty that it can take weight. Like it's meant to carry laptops and cameras. So I like this. This kit is not cheap also. And to achieve the height that most artist alleys have, you will probably need to buy two of these. So I think one of these kits is almost like a hundred dollars, at least when I bought it and I bought two and I actually have three now because I've made my display harder and com more complicated on myself and unnecessarily so. This is what we have though. So you have these poles and then usually I'll build these two up to the height that I want. My ceiling is not very high, so I'm just gonna do like a short version just to show you guys. But this is what we are working with. And then this will clamp. Can you guys see? I don't know. Go like this and then you just screw it until it's secure. And when I travel, I like to put three of them together and then hold them together with this Velcro. And this is really, really handy. Um, I'll show you why because of how I hang my posters. But I just take out the bundles and then I just screw these in. We're gonna do the mini version. Usually I think for artist alleys, I'm able to do four posts. So like one more, and then that would be the typical height of an artist alley table. It depends on the regulations of the convention center usually, so I can't give you an exact, but we're gonna do the mini version today, which is fine. Another one. I will say though that these are probably heavier to travel with than a telescoping or tripod because these base pieces are quite heavy and dense and it's metal, so. It's high quality, but that also means it's it's weighty, so. Pick and choose your battles, you know? Hold on, I'll just go in here. Okay, so we gotta do the other side. Spin this over. This, we're just screwing it in. Okay, in this bag, I have the carrying pieces because obviously we have the two poles, but then we need to do something that comes out like this across. And we need a little piece that enable us to put the cross piece in. And I actually wanna tell you guys about this plastic bag. So you know when you go to like TJ Maxx or Ross and then you get like your new set of sheets or whatever and it comes in this like plasticky kind of bag like this. I love these because they're like clear, thick vinyl, whatever, and zip. So I used to use Ziploc bags to hold everything, but they're so thin that, and my pieces of like random metal stuff just like break them. And it just, they started break, like breaking apart and I didn't like that. So I just bought a like 20 pack of these linen storage baggies to hold everything and I love it. And so I use it to hold all the connecting pieces and then the little connectors for my display and all that kind of stuff. But they're thick, they're clear and they zip. And I love that. So I don't know why, but I'm very excited about this tiny detail because it took me like a year before I figured out, hey, I need a better storage plan for all my stuff. So very excited to speak the gospel of these plastic bags. <laughs> okay, as I was saying, the kit comes with two of these, so back here to the front, it's two of these. And as you can see, there's this little hole and then the little screw top right here. And so that way, when you put it on top of the pole, then you can put another one straight through this way. So just one on each side. And then you can also kind of affect the height 
of your pole going across by determining which side that you put it in. So you can either do this, this way, which puts the pole in front like this, or if you mount it up this way with the pole coming in through here, then you get like an extra half inch of height for your pole going across. So just a little small detail for you to consider, but I usually like to put it this way. So this goes in and same on this side. I hope I've been recording this whole time. Sometimes I don't press the record button. No, it's going. Oh, but you guys can't really see. So I have those connector pieces and now we need to build the pole that will go across. Just these, screw them together like so. And sometimes at conventions, I need help doing this part too. It's a little bit short, so you also need to be mindful of how far apart this thing goes, here, how far apart you set your poles. Because as you can see here, we're like one inch short, so I just need to bring this in a little bit. So usually at conventions, this is probably gonna be one pole taller, but we're doing the small version as I have said before. Um, but this is the nice little frame. Now, sometimes you might have more prints and you might wanna utilize the side panels. So in order to do that, I think you're gonna have to buy another kit. So at least two in able to do it for these little brace pieces and extra poles right here because you need that extra pole to add right here like this so you can do like this so you can add another arm coming out this way so that way you can utilize the sides as well so if we wanted to add the side arms i'm going to add this piece so this is the extra piece i'm just going to slide it on here and make sure that there's enough space for the top piece to also go on top like this and then just tighten the bottom one like that. Here, I put two poles together for the side arm and just putting it across like this. And most artist alleys aren't gonna let you extend beyond the surface of your table, so you might need to push this back a little bit. And so far, we have one arm. I'll just get the other one up. If you are doing side arms, it is helpful to remember to just do this part first, actually. But I'm not always good at remembering. I think building this part is actually the most tedious thing and takes me the longest. If my partner's here with me, usually we can get this whole thing set up within like 40 to 40 minutes to an hour. But when I'm by myself, usually I'll take like 90 minutes and then if I have a 10 by 10 spot or a corner spot it'll take me like properly two and a half hours just by myself so the other part is that I always change my mind I always think something looks really ugly or if I have a corner spot I'm like hey I gotta capitalize on this so it's like how do I take advantage of a corner spot because you have visibility on the side so you want to build out your side that has the aisle next to it so it's like you have to get really creative with it. All right, so here we have a typical Artist Alley setup of my frame. So I have these two, the side arms that come out, and then now it's the print time. So like I said before, I always like to build out and then in. So the next part will be the art prints. So I have two sets of prints, one that is for a six foot table and one that is for an eight foot table setup. And at this point, they're both kind of mixed up, but this is an example of what it will look like. I take the prints and I print a number on there and then I tape them together in the columns. And I plan this out on something like Procreate and I map them out so the numbers make sense reading across. So from left to right, top to bottom will be one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, 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 blah. And then I coordinate them to be in columns so that way it's easy to store 
and then I just put them up one column at a time and then it reads perfectly. On top of that, <laughs> I also put Velcro on the top half. A lot of people will do like curtain rings, um, which I find very convenient, but Velcro is a little bit lighter and like adjustable still. So, and I also use the Velcro straps to strap all the poles together. So there's just like multi-use, but I'm gonna show you guys how I actually hang this up. I'm just gonna get all the prints in order actually. So you can kind of understand what I'm talking about, but these three, this one's four. This one is one. All right, friends, so as you can see, I have each of my columns like this, and I have them numbered so they read across like this and then the bottom row, but each one is separated as its own column and I have them taped on the back. And then on top, I have the little Velcro strips. So I'm gonna show you guys how I actually get these hung up. Okay, so this is how I attach the posters to the actual bar. I like using Velcro because they're a lot lighter than like curtain rings that a lot of people use. Um, and they're adjustable and flexible and like there's no like width requirement that you really need to account for. So what I do is I take the strap of Velcro and on here I have the spiky side and I need to make sure that the spiky side, the scratchy side, ends up facing this way because the soft side is what I attach to the posters. So the hook and loop, they just need to make sure that you have the two opposite textures, right? So what I do is I take this scratchy side facing that way and I just loop it through across twice. Squeeze it down so it's nice and secure. So this is all the scratchy part. I have my poster column here and this is the soft side. And then it's just easy. Like you just attach it right on like this. Right on top. So it looks like that. Ta -da! And this is what the back looks like. So it's just the scratchy part attached like so. Okay, I did leave a little bit of a window because I wanted to show you guys now how I incorporate my big tapestries. Shout out to Yumi Tang because she was the one that convinced me to go bigger or go home. So I went bigger and I'm home. So best of both worlds. But I have decided to invest in these large canvas prints as part of my product line. And they are two feet by three feet. So they big like this and the way I hang these is actually pretty similar to how most other people do their prints. So a lot of them will do curtain rings with the little clips. Got my little box out here. This is my little box of miscellaneous hardware. But essentially what I'm talking about are these things. So you just buy them at Target for a kit and then you have to make sure that you buy one that is the width that has enough clearance for the thickness of your bars so that was a mistake that i made i went too small so this is i think this is one and a half 1.25 or something like that but now i have two of these just because i did not want to waste sticking velcro onto the back of these large prints because they are so expensive to make and, and i just want to be able to sell the display in case i need it because i don't carry a lot of stock with me so what i end up doing and yumi's the one who taught me how to do this too but on these rings there are these little clips right but these clips have teeth and I don't know if you can see that, but they're pretty sharp and I don't want the teeth to destroy the quality or kind of make holes into the canvas. So what I do is I take a little piece of paper or a little post-it and I just fold it over and over like this. And then I put this in between the clip and the canvas so it doesn't hurt the canvas. I've got two of these and then I fold this in half. So it's just like this. And then on the canvas, I'll put the little piece of paper and then I'll put this over this. So it holds it like that without compromising the canvas integrity to the clip. Also, if you are planning to incorporate a large print to your display like this, you definitely need to plan ahead. So before you put your regular size posters up, remember that you're gonna have to attach, like slide this on. It's not like the Velcro where it's the strap separately and you can just put it around it on the structure of this. This has to be fed into the end of the poles. So it requires a little bit of forethought, uh, which I clearly didn't do here, but it's okay. The power of editing. <laughs> So let's get this on. I don't know if I have enough space. Maybe I need to take down one. Just for the sake of the video, I didn't put all my prints up. 
So something to consider is if you are primarily a print artist, remember that being able to display all your prints might get very, very, very difficult very fast because there's a very finite amount of space, especially on the artist alleys where they limit how high you can go up. So for me, it's usually worked out that I can display about 18, 19, or 20 posters. Most of the time I have an extra sheet that has like my prices and bundle deals and that kind of stuff. But just keep in mind that you really should plan out like what you want to show. And if you're going to have more, how will the attendee know that you have more? Something to consider. And this, let's say for example, I'm planning to put this on the side or the middle. Thread this through like that. And then I can put this back on. And this one, you can either undo it or restrap it. These are already in the loops though, so I might as well just re-thread this back on. There is the issue of these rings being quite slidey on the bar. So sometimes your tapestries or your big prints might end up looking like this. So what I do is just, I take a piece of masking tape and just secure this so it doesn't move. Masking tape. For me, masking tape is absolutely a con necessary tool. This has saved my butt in a lot of precarious display situations. But I literally just take the piece of tape and just tape it across on the bar for security. <laughs> and honestly, most of the time this is good enough and it's, I've never had issues from doing something like this. So I do fully recognize that this does seem a little low, but remember that I am about 15 inches short of my usual display. So just imagine that the bottom of this is like up here. And that actually gives me plenty of space for a little window for like chit chat and taking transactions. The next step is the cubes. I use the cubes for storage and as a way to tier my displays up and higher so that people don't have to crouch down and look at stuff. So what I'm gonna build is the usual typical layout that I usually do, but I'm pretty intentional with it because I want storage in the back, but I want it to look clean in the front. And then I also wanna be able to utilize the sides right here because there's still a bit of space right here for various items. So let's do it. Basic white panels like this. And I also have the wire kinds like this. I like the wire kinds because you can clip stuff to different levels of it, which might be helpful for different items that you have. Let's build. So bring out a few of these guys. And then I have my bag for all the connecting pieces. Honestly, this part is also quite tedious to me. I don't know if there's an aspect to my table build that isn't tedious. Start off with this, and I usually like to do one cube out like this. So it will start here. I guess while I'm building this, do you have any questions for me? I usually like doing a little bit of chit chat, but I'm not very good at it to be honest. I've been doing Artist Alley for about two and a half years, but I have been one and a half year full time. So I have done my fair share of many different types of events and have gone all over the country for this. <laughs> I had no idea that this career even existed Ugh. or that this could even be a possibility. And I think the two first people that exposed me to this kind of thing was Julianne Doodles, Pepper Cut, who is my good friend, and also Macy from Volcana. They were the two that I found their Artist Alley vlogs and I just became obsessed with it. Like at that point, I hadn't even gone to a convention as an attendee, never. And I've actually still have never been to a convention as just an attendee. <laughs> so it's just kind of wild. I always go as an Artist Alley and I feel like I can't go to a convention anymore without feeling the FOMO of like, oh, I could be making sales. <laughs> And I don't think that's a very good look on me, but like, you know, when this is your livelihood and you're obsessed with yourself and your small business, it's hard to not think about it or turn your brain off about it. Oh God, I'm not very strong. I put this connector in the wrong orientation. You can get away with not orienting all the connectors correctly, but it's kind of better to just do it right for the stability aspect, honestly. 
I technically went to school to learn how to draw, but not in the stylistic artsy way. My undergrad, I studied industrial design, so I learned how to draw in a very technical kind of way from perspective and like taking measurements and proportions and that kind of stuff. So that's what I mean by technical. But you know what? Like once you know the basics of how to draw, you can take it in any direction that you want to. But one of the assignments that we had to do was a whole sheet of just cubes. Cubes and tubes, those are your building blocks for learning how to draw anything. Because once you know how to do those correctly in perspective, you can literally build anything. Drawing cubes is a lot easier for me um, because it's just geometric and straight lines. So I'm a lot more confident with that. But but it kind of exposes my weakness of not being able to draw characters because characters are so organic and the anatomy studies and all that stuff. So I've never done anatomy studies. I just kind of like eyeball it. <laughs> and you can tell in my work, okay. I make my characters this small in like a big environment or I try not to show their face or their hands or like too much of their body <laughs> just because I suck at it. But you know, that's something that I need to grow in and that's something that has always challenged me. But it's important to recognize that wherever you are now, like if things don't go well for you right now, don't take it personally. You just have to understand that you're not at your fullest potential, you know? Like there's always room and place to grow. Sometimes I'm sad about things like, I'm not, me being not being able to pull off what I wanted to pull off in an illustration. And I'm mad about it to myself because I just don't have the skill set to get there. But with the, each next piece, I know I'm gonna get closer and closer to what I see in my head. And I want to convey that to you guys and, and people who are buying my art. I don't know. I just want to be worth the amount of money that people are paying me to bring something cool to their lives, you know? <laughs> Okay, so here I have my first cube set up and then usually I like to flank both sides and make it as symmetrical as possible. It looks a little awkward right now because I'm doing the mini version of my usual display, but let me build out the second part. And you know, I've been on this Artist Alley grind for over a year and I knew I wanted to make the switch when I could predict that the amount of money I was gonna make was gonna be more than the salary I was gonna get from graduating, grad school and all that. It was an easy switch. It was easy and hard because I was in the field of mental health before all of this and the mental health field needs to grow and I think it needs more people and um, people with compassion and kindness to help others out there that are struggling with the things that they're struggling with, obviously. I don't really know where I'm going with this, but to disclose, yes, I live with my partner, my longtime partner, um, and he has a full-time regular job as a software engineer. So he has been my financial safety net. There is the stereotype that art is incredibly unstable and honestly, the stereotype is true. Money is incredibly unstable. This career is unstable. So, you know, unless you are that famous, and you know that someone out there will always be buying your stuff and that's great. But you know, conversion rates are usually pretty low, honestly. Like I think in general business, you can expect conversion rates if like you meet a hundred people, maybe one person will buy something from you. Or on the internet, if your post reaches thousands of people, maybe only a handful of people will purchase from you. So it's a numbers game, it's a reach game. It's a word of mouth game. You have to constantly put yourself out here and keep doing this kind of thing. <laughs> so there's a lot of factors that have to line up in order to make a career in art viable, but the world needs art, truly. I really think so. It makes you feel something. It makes you some like be able to talk about something or bond with someone about, or just make you see something in a different way. That's fantastic. And we need more human artists out here to bring more of that to the world. Cause the way that you see the world totally matters and you should share it with others. With your skill and your talent and your background. I'm just gonna build out another shelf right over here. Usually I do at least two deep on both sides. So in one of my friend groups, we actually go out and do trivia. Like just go out to the local bars and do trivia. Like usually it's just general pop culture, but one of the bars hosted a Avatar The Last Airbender trivia night. And that's my shit. Like I was so excited. I was like, we have to go. And I made all my friends sign up, even though they're not as like 
big fans. I think everyone has seen it as like kids, but maybe not as like fanatically as I have. <laughs> but I went and I made my friends come with me. I won. I literally won. I won the entire trivia. I think there were like two dozen teams probably. <laughs> and when the trivia questions came out, so it's like on a sheet of paper, I just took it and I just started filling in the answers. Like, you know that kid in school when you get the test and then they just fill in all the answers and usually like you're supposed to like kind of get walked through, at least some some classes, like the teacher would like read out questions and then you would walk through maybe one or two questions. Anyways, I was like on, on top of it. It starts off really easy and then each round gets progressively harder. By the end of the fourth round, there were 12 teams that were at a perfect tie. Not a single team had missed a question. Like half the team did not miss a single question up until round four and then round five six and seven it got way way harder so then it started to come out with variations and then i think two teams missed two questions or something so no there was like three teams that missed like two questions so places two three and four were all tied and there was a tiebreaker question and that question was how many lines does uncle iroh have in the entire show we wrote an answer but we were completely off the answer was about 350 i believe <laughs> We wrote like 900 <laughs> but for us it didn't matter because i answered every single question correctly <laughs> i literally gave us a perfect score okay there is one question that we did miss i think every single team missed it so they might have thrown out that question but i also got bonus points because one of the questions was what are each of the bending styles based off of as in like which fighting style was it based off of you only needed to list out the styles so like water bending is tight Chi and then earth bending is hungar style. You only needed to list out tai chi, hungar, northern Shaolin style, whatever. But I also labeled all of them, so I got bonus points. So because I missed one question or it was thrown out, and then I got the bonus point, it technically gave our team a perfect score, <laughs> and I won. <laughs> I won. I won the trivia. I have never won trivia in my entire fucking life. <laughs> so this was a very, very exciting time for me. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And what's funny is that my two friends, as they were announcing the winners of trivia, they went from like bottom to the top. And when it was our team name that was announced and our team name was Avatar Kyoshi did nothing wrong. <laughs> they got so excited that they leapt up and like went to the table <laughs> to claim the prize, but <laughs> they didn't even contribute much. So my handwriting was uggo. <laughs> So rude. <laughs> Because usually it's my other friend who does all the handwriting for the trivia answers and she has like perfect handwriting but I have like really scrawly, scribbly handwriting and he was surprised because I'm an artist and so he was like, I would have figured that your handwriting was pretty and I'm like, no but it's like, this is just what it looks like. I am what I am. And he's like, it's ugly and I'm like, I don't like you anymore. <laughs> but those two, they went up to the table before me and my partner Nick even got up and we, I mean, we were excited but Nick wanted to finish his beer and I was just like soaking it in but they were the ones who went to the the table and claim the prize <laughs> which was just really funny because we have never ever ever gotten first place i think out of the dozens of times we've been to bar trivia we've been in top three one time but like we are usually like middle of the pack very average and some of the teams had like really really good names some of them were called the azula apologists <laughs> That's a hot one. There was also the backbenders. Those were the two that I really remember. There was like Flamio Hotman, which was really cute. Ember Island Players. There were a couple teams that were named that. I don't know, there was some, oh, there was also Azula's Therapy Group. That was a good team name, so. <laughs> it was just really funny to me. Okay, I've been chit-chatting for a long, long time, but let me just finish this real quick. Ta-da! So there's two sides that are usually symmetrical. I like doing two, and then let me bring you to the other side. And this is what the back side looks like. And just remember that this is usually like higher. So this is more of a window right here. But then I have these cubbies right here that are perfect for storing stuff. Now I have this panel right here because I like to utilize this space to hang more stuff. So this is one of my more bestseller, most popular tote bag. And usually what I do is just take regular old binder clips and just clip it on here. <laughs> And I like to show that the strap is there so people can see how thick the canvas is and how thick the handles are, like that. So that looks pretty cute. And then sometimes if I have the space or the height, again, remember that this is supposed to be like a foot higher. I'll put another panel here so I can just move this across like this. But here's another one. This one's my muddled up club one, also very popular. I like using really cute hair clips, but you can also clip another one right here on the side, like so, or something like that, you know? Just, just so it's cute. 
Now, this is how I do my mini prints. Since I'm doing a six foot table, I'm just gonna show you what I usually do. But if I have something that is a little bit bigger, I usually like to bring out the wooden display. So for, especially for a 10 by 10 spot, um, or if I have a corner spot, I can use the wooden displays, which I'll have a picture right here for you. So you know what the heck I'm talking about. But this is how I transport my mini prints. My mini prints are five by seven inches postcard size and they fit perfectly in this Tupperware. Yeah, I've seen some of my friends just like put their mini prints raw dog into the suitcase and I'm just like, oh, I am not brave enough to do that. I just worry about the quality of like it getting wrinkled or anything. But I mean, hey, if it works for them, then like they save a lot of weight from not using the Tupperwares. But what I usually like to do is I bring these hay crates around and I love these things. And you don't have to get hay crates, but I bought these on sale, but they are just the mini size and they fold down really well. And here I am reconstructing them. And I have found that if you stack two of these on top of each other, they are a more comfortable height for people to peruse. We usually have to bring around a couple of these bins of mini prints, which, and this is quite dense, but what we like to do is divide them by design and then package them in bundles of 10. So that makes restocking and doing inventory way easier. So I'll just bring out one or two bundles, and this is 20 right here, and I know that right away. So that when we take them out, they fit perfectly right in the bin right here. And then I can use these dividers. I made these from comic book dividers. I trimmed them and I rounded out the corners. I did the most. And then I use it as a separate and I usually have this labeled and that way people can just like flip through them and pick out the design that they want and then it doesn't take up as much space on your table for other products. That bundling idea by the way was from my partner. He's like smart or whatever I guess but just for the sake of the video I only brought out one box of designs so I'm just gonna pretend to fill it in but you get the idea right so it's like this and then people can just flip through and look. And because this is such a hands-on self-serve situation, I like to put it here on the side, right here, maybe a little bit angled so people can comfortably look down and flip through it like this. But that's also why sometimes I like to put this tote bag a little bit higher and do the second panel so it's not like overshadowed, but this is for the vlog. The next thing that goes on my table is my print book. I have found that, yes, it takes up a lot of square footage on your table, but it is really, really nice to entice people to look at your art more intensely. And if you can't display all of them, you can put more of them in here and maybe just label more prints here so people can go through and flip through it and just like really soak in your art. And that way they are more enticed to purchase your art. So I like to put it, this is just a cheap wooden painting, a painter's, easel i guess tabletop easel it was like less than 20 dollars. you don't need to get something super expensive and then right here on the corner right over there and then this is my print book my print size is 11 by 14 so when you open up the book like this it almost spans like two feet across which on a six foot table is very very precious space i understand but it really helps the other thing that you want to do with your display book is if you are using a number system also label the prints in here so number eight um this is not correct because these are from two different sets of display. Um, but for example, these should both be labeled number eight just so people can communicate with you more easily on how or which print that they want. And then here I also have a little note also available as a 24 by 36 canvas, just so people know that this print is now available in this size and maybe they'll be interested in getting the bigger one. Okay. Now I wanted to show you guys some behind the table action of what I do to store the stuff behind the table for my prints primarily just because it's that point. <laughs> so pretend that this is your chair that they give you at Artist Alley. Actually, I'm gonna move this out of the way over here. But most of the time, most artists will have all their luggage with them. And so these are my two biggest pieces. Usually we max out at four. Sometimes we bring an extra suitcase home in case it doesn't fit or whatever. But we always usually have like two suitcases. These will hold your miscellaneous things. But what I like to do is format it and use these as tables in the back. So usually there's enough forgiveness where I can stack this right here and then stack the other one right on top like this. And then I can have seating here, seating here, and more storage under the table. But this is nice because of how I operate to get the poster prints for customers. Ah, so this is how I travel with my posters. I have these archival boxes and they open like this. They are just from Amazon and they are a little bit more expensive, but this form factor is really, really nice. And then what I do is that 
I put all the posters in a sleeve and then I number it corresponding to the display numbers, right? So that way when someone says, hey, I want number nine, I go to the box that's labeled prints nine through 18, print, take this out and then take it out like that. But what's nice about having this side table action is that they just get stored up here. And that way, when I'm sitting here, I can just turn, open it up the box, flip through them, get to the number two sleeves and just pull. And if they want this design, pull this one as well, put them in a poster sleeve and then hand it to the customer. It is the most easy form factor that I have dealt with. And I really, really like this. And also it provides a little bit of a boundary between you and your table neighbor. Um, and ideally like, you know, this is another reason why I don't like tripod displays because they take up so much of a footprint behind the table. You probably won't be able to do something like this um, because you'll just extend past what your little boundary is and you wanna be courteous to your neighbors, you know? So I have never had an issue with someone complaining about this kind of setup and it works really, really well. This, and then my partner will usually sit right here. So yeah, we're like sitting real, real close, but it's okay. And it works like this. Okay now, the other use I have for hay crates is a checkout station. So I like to build another tower of just two stacks like this. Maybe actually flip this over. And I have this custom checkout station that I got off Etsy. It's just made out of acrylic and I think this person just laser cut the pieces off, but it has this base right here, here, and then this piece. There is supposed to be like one more little piece right here, but I lost that a long time ago. But imagine that this is the slot where I put my business cards. This is just like my Instagram and all brand information. And then my square reader would just sit right here. It is very, very convenient. And another thing that's big part of my business are my stickers. And so I keep my stickers in these sticker trays like this. And it's very convenient because when I pack them up for travel, I literally just take a piece of masking tape and tape all the way across and then tape, 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 tape. So the stickers don't fall out, but then they're already packed and easy to go. So I just like doing that. And they're always in these trays. And so for the trays, I just put them in the middle because these are the cheapest item I have on my table. So they are very popular, but also because it's so colorful and there's so many, it just makes for a very eye-catching central design of your table. This little spot left on a six foot table is perfect for four trays, but I have also considered going down to two because I'm introducing more products to my table. But I don't know, I used to have six of these trays, so it would take up so much space, but I have like since narrowed it down. Sometimes you just don't need to go that ham. But this, I'm gonna go over here. I actually used to put the mini prints up here, but for the short girlies, it was hard for them to like get up there and like look over. So I have brought this down here and that makes a lot more sense. And one other thing that is a big part of my table are my mystery bags. So usually I have a bundle deal that is like, these usually go, these are 50 or $55. And I will stuff anywhere between at least $75 worth of stuff. So mini prints, stickers, and a tote bag and a pin. And they will go in here. And usually their value is at least 75 up to 95. Usually I'll have a little tag right here, but I can't be bothered to like make, the, <laughs> make them right now. But I like to have at least four on display so when people do want to buy a mystery bag they have a selection because it's just more fun if you're able to pick amongst a bunch of stuff here it's another one and i do realize that these are blocking some of the prints but again this is supposed to be taller so it actually behind this the lowest print will usually sit like right here so it's still visible but as you can see the table fills up really really fast with all your stuff so it'll look something like this now, if you wanna make things like really cute, get yourself some cutouts of your characters or mascots of your table. But these are the janky ones that I made like months ago. If there's a blank spot like this, I'll just put a character right there. Oh, I usually put her right in front of the checkout and then this one's like right here somewhere, that. And then this one will go like either here or on the side or sometimes I've managed to like clip it on the top. <laughs> But, you know, just add some like pizzazz, some character, some literal character to your table like this. <laughs>
And I just think that it, it helps the look of your brand so, so much. And I love when people do it, so yeah. There are some other products that I am missing, but as you can see, like you are kind of running out of space. I have an enamel pins and I actually put my enamel pins onto a panel. So actually, if this was my convention thing, I would probably just replace this panel with an enamel pin panel. So it will look like that. And this is what it looks like right here because I can't find it right now. So I'm just gonna <laughs> throw a picture in. So that would probably go right here. And then I also have my new sticker sheets. So maybe Maybe I might even take this down and then put my sticker sheets like right here on display um, with price tags and whatnot. So yeah, I mean, you don't always have to have these, but these just help. It's just like character building. <laughs> so for the video though, this is here and it's fine. Something like that. It has become very filled. The other thing that you cannot forget about for your table are your price tags. These are what I use to hold my price tag. So it's this flat clip right here on this bendable spot connector right here to this. And so for my mini prints, usually I'll just slide my price tag right here and people can see that pretty easily. And then for stickers, I'll usually have this like right here or kind of in the middle right there. And then I'll turn this and angle it so people can see the price right there. Here, open it and then just slide this in. That way it's very visual so people can see it and they're not always asking you, how much are your stickers? <laughs> but absolutely just don't forget to add your price tags to everything. It helps give confidence to the shopper, I find so they know right away what their budget is and if it's worth it or they don't have to ask you if they're really really shy this is two top halves that I put pieced together sometimes I find that this form factor works really well um, especially on the wooden displays I just clamp it on top like this and it just holds better and sometimes I will also use this for my characters for example if I wanted him on top clamp and clamp and that just works really really well like that we could also attach him to the sticker tray like so and that because there's more surface area, it makes it more sturdy. And that's also really cute. And now this is how I store my washi tape for display. This acrylic thing is a business card holder and it has eight slots and two washi tapes fit perfectly in one slot just so that you have it on display so people can see. But for washi tapes, it's also really, really nice to have a side display of samples of your washi tape. So I usually have that. I've sold out of a lot of them, so I don't have it available right now, but this is how I like to do it. Again, work with tiers. Like that just makes your display look so much stronger. Nothing is flat and everything has levels to it. And for this, I usually like to put it right up here. So usually the washi tapes are right there. We're almost at the end. <laughs> I just wanted to talk about packaging. So I have different size bags for different types of orders. So if someone is just buying stickers, I use these paper ones with my stamp on them. It's just more environmentally friendly, I think, and just easily disposable. Also, it shows up your brand if you stamp them. So that's really, really nice. Um, and that way you don't have to like use a sticker, another sticker to close it. Usually I'll just fold it over and then put washi tape on top to secure it. I have these bags. Bags. So these are actually bakery bags for pastries and stuff. So I have the square size that I will use for enamel pins, stickers, washi tapes. So there's smaller things will go in these. And I like them because they have a clear front so people can see what's in there. And as I have shown in my vlogs, I like to stamp the back of it or the top edge. So when it folds over, you have a little bit of branding there. And then I usually seal it up and then use my own washi tape or it's washi tape that people have given me just to like close it, seal it down a little bit. And then the last size is a slightly bigger version of these ones. And these I use for mini prints. They are big, so you can just slide your mini print in like this. And again, I like the window aspect, which is really cool. And it fits the mini prints very, very well. And you fold it over, seal it up, and it would look like this. And people love this. Sometimes these are really, really hard to find. So I just go through and comb Amazon or find different manufacturers that have these and just like bulk, so. I recently just bought like 5,000 of them. So I'm kind of married to these for my packaging. But yeah, keep packaging really simple. And if you're really trying to save the environment, ask them if they want a bag because half the time they don't or they already have something. So just reduce the amount of packaging out in this world. So there's that. And all of these I store in the little cubbies in the back side. So they're easy to grab and just put in the stuff, take the transaction and people are on their way. Ah. <laughs> I have been recording for like five hours. <laughs>
It doesn't usually take me five hours to set up a table, obviously. I think I said this five hours ago in the beginning of the video when I started recording, but usually a setup like this will take me and my partner like 40 minutes to do, if I'm by myself, like an hour. This is what it is. It fills out really nicely. And you know, when you bring in new products, of course there are some things that have to change or you have to maybe get rid of a tray or sacrifice this or something like that. It just depends on the kind of products that you are bringing to your literal table. So I hope that you found this video helpful though and thanks for hanging out with me. I'm really tired. I'm also sweating because it's peak hours and our AC is off. It's so hot in Arizona right now. That's like my entire personality is just talking about Arizona weather. <laughs> But yeah, this is the whole display. And again, I hope you found this really helpful. And if you have any tips or tricks or something cool that you bring to your table that you think the world should know, please let me know. I love seeing how people make their systems work, their workflow and, and you know, that kind of stuff. So please let me know. I'm really genuinely curious. I like looking at other people's displays because I get ideas and you know, steal like an artist, steal an idea, but make it your own, elaborate on it, create and build on top of it and show them how you can do it in your own way. So I hope that you liked this. I hope that you let me know if you see anything that you think I could improve on. Or if you have any questions for me, let me know down below. But thanks for hanging. See you in the next thing. Bye. Okay, as I was cleaning up, I also realized I didn't talk about these half panels right over here. These are actually from a shoe organizer kit. And I think this is a little bit longer than a 12. So this is your standard 12 by 12 or 11 and a half, 11 by a half cube grid. And this one's a little bit longer. It probably looks like 16 ish. So 16 by 12. And if you want to get a really nice clean half shelf situation, I have that kit linked in my description in my Amazon as well. So you can build yourself a really nice little half shelf right here. Thank you.